Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to what is the third now, I think, in our fellowship uh, seminar series. Uh, today you'll be hearing from Dr. Jessica Corte about her work on um, a technologies pipeline for human visual communication. Um, but before I introduce uh, Jessica, I'll just give you a little bit of background uh, as to the seminar series. The, the fellows, uh, we have four fellows with the centre. They all uh, came, have come on board in the last three or four months. Um, and really, uh, the fellows uh, work with us on uh, cutting edge programs of development uh, to try and solve what we consider significant problems in the autonomous systems space. Um, I'm the Chief Engineer, Simon Ng, for, from uh, the Trusted Autonomous Systems Defence CRC, and we have a few other members of the CRC here with us today, but I'll be your host. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this is due to run for an hour. Um, it is recorded, as I said earlier, so just please be aware of that, and the video will be available afterwards on our YouTube site. Um, probably take a couple of days to get up there. Uh, just some etiquette. So I'll ask everyone to mute themselves if, if they're not speaking, please use the, the chat facility. If you want to ask a question, I'll try and monitor that and, and make sure that we get to as many questions as we can towards the end. The seminar will run for approximately 35 uh, minutes of presentation, then probably 10 to 15 minutes of question time. Um, I think I've covered off all the etiquette. So hopefully, hopefully everyone uh, knows to, to mute themselves. Um, just a little bit about Jessica before we kick off. Uh, she did her Doctor of Philosophy um, at uh, Griffith University and has a Bachelor of Information Technology um, with class, first class honours also from Griffith. Um, her previous academic roles have included uh, teaching focused and teaching and research programs at Griffith College, Griffith University, and now of course at the University of Queensland. And she's also a qualified Auslan one and two uh, qualified Auslan 1 and 2 through Deaf Services Queensland, and you'll understand a bit about why that's so relevant uh, today as, as Jessica speaks to us. Um, she's an affiliate member of the Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language uh, and is clearly passionate about how technology can be used to improve people's lives. Interestingly, and perhaps impressively, uh, Jessica is also one of four finalists for the Rising Star Technology Award, Award which, is part, which is a category in the Women in Technology Awards for 2020. So if you would like to go and see those awards announced virtually on the 9th of October, I think it is, um, you can register at wit.org.au and hopefully Jessica will be announced as a winner. Um, Everyone should be able to see the splash screen I have up. So uh, that's the title for today's talk, Developing a Technologies Pipeline for Human Machine Visual Communication. And that is a, a picture of Jessica, so you know what she looks like. Uh, without further ado, I will now hand over to Jessica. So Jesse, if you want to take control and bring up your slide. Oh. Hopefully this will work. Maybe I need to stop sharing, no? No, nope, that should be working. Good to go. And I will pin your video if I can, so that everyone can see you the whole time. Alrighty. Um, hopefully everyone can now see my slides at this point. Um, as Simon says, the topic of today's talk is the new fellowship project that I'm working on developing a technologies pipeline for visual gestural human machine interaction and communication. Um, this is part of my TAS DCRC fellowship um, and it will be running in partnership with DST group. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm presenting, which are the Yagara and the Turrbal peoples and pay my respects to the elders past present and emerging of the traditional custodians of the lands all around Australia. My talk today is broken up into a couple of sections. I'm going to start by telling you about the motivation and context for the work that I'm going to be undertaking, particularly around gestural human machine interfaces for human robot teaming. And then I'm going to tell you about Australian Sign Language. This is related, I promise, and I will explain why. 
I'm then going to dive into my project, which is developing the Auslan Communication Technologies Pipeline, talk you through a couple of sample research questions, and hopefully wrap everything up, proving my point that Auslan is the perfect vehicle for developing um, gestural human machine interface technologies. Okay, so let's get started. Everyone at this point is probably familiar with one or more mainstream AI language technology. You've probably used Siri or OK Google or Alexa or Google Translate or insert thing here. That works quite well for, well, relatively well for a mainstream language like English. These technologies are able to be created at this period in history because of the development of technology, so that we have the technical capability, the development of machine learning approaches, so that we have technologies that work more or less the way we need them to, and also that we have large data sets of written and or spoken samples of the language. So this allows the development of mainstream languages, very speech heavy and writing heavy, However, spoken human-to-human -human communication is not just about words. It's multimodal. When you are interacting with another person, you are not just speaking, but you'll be gesturing. You'll have facial expressions. You'll have body language. And if you're face-to-face, -face, you'll have a common field of reference, which is important in helping to communicate. Um, as a side note, this is one of the reasons why Zoom is so very difficult, because we're missing some of that uh, interaction and body language. That's important not just from the speaker, but also from the audience or the interlocutors, because interactions are not just one directional, they're multi-directional as we present our message and check the understanding of our audience, either through explicit responses or through implicit back channel responses, body language type things, again. So this leads me to the DST Kelpie project, um, which is intended to develop ways of interacting with robots in military contexts that mimic the way farmers interact with farm dogs. Because if you ever see a farmer, they don't say, okay, Siri, go round up those sheep. They say a whistle, a gesture, and the dog knows what it needs to go off and do. But to get machines working that way, we need tools and techniques to help us understand gesture and body language. And these tools don't exist. So Kelpie intends to develop bi-directional interaction via intuitive, naturalistic human machine interfaces that are contextually aware in the behavior and responses that are elicited. And the point of Kelpie is not to replace soldiers, but to augment them and not to restrict soldiers to very specific exact behaviors, which is what a lot of technologies we see try to do, but to enable naturalistic, realistic interactions with technology. So we are talking gestural human machine interaction. There are a couple of requirements for gestural human machine interaction that need to be addressed. The ones that are known and definite are things like needing to have standardized gestures that map to a particular reaction or response. In order to get this right, you need to be able to cope with the fact that humans vary the way they produce gestures. So, between individual people, you will get different people who produce the same gesture in slightly different ways. But you'll also find that you have a human, uh, one individual person produces the same gesture differently in different scenarios. Especially if you're in say a high stress situation like an operational environment. Um, this means that we need a level of robustness in gesture recognition um, that we haven't seen in any technology so far. But it can also have some security advantages if we can perhaps tap into the individual way of producing a gesture 
um, as sort of a way of mapping an interface to them. Um, we need obviously a way of encoding gestures and understanding them. Um, we need robust gesture recognition. And I've touched on some of this, but there's not just person to person and instance to instance variation, but the need to deal with visually noisy environments, potentially semi occluded or not direct signs and gestures. Someone's perhaps a bit side on. Um, and as we've said, variation in gesture production. Now these are, you know, the fairly standard, if you think about gesture recognition, these are the things we know we definitely need. But the things that would help to make any gesture recognition system better, more robust, more usable, are going to be the inclusion of things like non-standardized gestures, being able to approximate gestures from incomplete information, having multiple input modalities, whether that's, you know, all gestures, visual and haptic, or some combination of gesture and body language and speech. Um, and of course, longer term, being able to encode more than just gestures. Um, if we can have a system that's able to deal with gestures and speech and body language and the environment and the context in which the communication is taking place, then this is going to be particularly important at creating um, an AI that you can interact with in a more naturalistic way. So this brings me to Auslan. Auslan is Australian Sign Language. It is a sign language, sometimes referred to as a visual gestural language because it is produced through gestures, not just gestures, there's more to it, but gestures and it's read visually. Because it is the Australian Sign Language, it is the native language of the Australian Deaf community, and it is a full language, and it has the entire expressive capacity of language. It also sees real world use with fluent users who every day use the language in noisy conditions that will produce their signs with intersigner variation that are used to having multi-directional communication and quite excitingly, are usable at a distance. So this is one thing that I, as a hearing person learning Auslan found really important. Um, you can have a signed conversation at a much longer distance than a spoken conversation. Because with speech, we need the sound waves to carry, you know, clearly enough and far enough that it can be understood. And humans see a lot better than they hear. So if I was standing all the way back here, in order to make sure you hear me, I have to speak more loudly, but if I sign, you can see it. Now, signing, as I've said, is not just about gestures, it's multi-channel. So information does get conveyed in the hand movements, but also body language, expressions, and particularly what we call mouthing which is mouth motions that can mimic an English word in Auslan, um, but can also be specific to a particular sign. Um, Auslan also has varied lexicality. So information can be conveyed in fully lexical signs. These are the ones that if you look them up in the Auslan dictionary, they're always gonna look the same. These are often noun signs. So things like airplane will get produced more or less the same way every single time. It also has partially lexical signs, and particularly importantly, it has uh, situational use of space. Now we see this a lot in verbs in Auslan. So bear with me just a second. Um, my favorite example of this is the sign help. The canonical version of help looks like this, but the way I actually use it in conversation changes depending on what I'm talking about. So if I'm saying, I'll help you, I sign it that way. If I'm saying you help me, it moves back towards me. But I can also have different reference in space. So if we're having a conversation and I've already told you about my sister and I've located them in space here and my friend and I've located them in space here, then I can talk about my sister helps my friend. And the use of space here, even though the components of the sign are very similar, altered the meaning of it. 
Um, Auslan also has non-lexical signs, which is sometimes referred to as enactment. Uh, these are signs that are not standardized. You won't find them in a dictionary, but they're really important in conveying information. And to a human, they make a lot of sense. And again, my favorite example is a guy who was talking about living out back and the fact that you have to look inside your shoes for spiders in the morning. And he, in the middle of this conversation, you know, looking in the shoes for spiders and did this. Not a standard sign, but to the human communicating with him, you know 100% that he's just picked up a boot and shaken it out to get rid of the spiders. So this is what Auslan is. But my argument here is that Auslan and communication technologies built around Auslan will help to inform the future of gestural human machine interaction. Because it is a visual gestural language, we have a community of signers who are already used to using gesture in a formal communicative way, and we're able to learn from them. We can take the communicative aspects of gesture and the way they use it. We've also got that population that allows us to collect high quality data from expert visual gestural communicators. And if you know much about machine learning, you know that having a good data set is critical to being able to develop AI tools that will do everything we need them to do. The population of signers also allows us to have uh, verification and testing so that signers are able to uh, verify the accuracy, correctness and clarity of any sign recognition and production. Um, so overall, Auslan technologies are going to underlie the theoretical and practical foundations of gestural human machine interaction because every problem that we solve in trying to recognize, produce, and process Auslan signing helps us to address a problem in gestural HMI. So just to make sure I'm making my point, we know that we need for gestural human machine interaction standardized gestures. Well, we have those in Auslan in lexicalized signs. We know that there's variation in gesture production. So we have a population of native signers so we can collect data with realistic variation inside it. We also have a population who can validate whether or not something is actually close enough that you could tell what it is meant to be, or if no, this is actually too different. We shouldn't count this as being the same sign. In terms of encoding the data, well, linguists have got there first. Um, linguists have identified elements of signs that they refer to as handshape, orientation, location, movement, and expression, which is better off defined as non-manual features, but that doesn't make a you know, fancy acronym. Um, and we need robust gesture recognition. So in this project, I'm hoping to be able to take some of the existing computer vision approaches and pair them with a new approach called entropy-based AI which will allow us to use multi-channel words and slightly fuzzy encoding to get more robust recognition. Um, now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this talk defining entry-based AI. If you came along to Dr. Andrew Back's talk two months ago now, he went into a lot of detail on it. Um, but I do have some slides later on in the presentation where I'll explain what I mean by some of these terms and how I'm going to be using them. Now, Auslan also lets us address some of the possible requirements for GHMI, specifically non-standardized gestures, which map well to the semi-lexical and non-lexical signing, um, and the fact that we have incomplete gesture information that we need to deal with. So here, I'm hoping that we can draw from some of the techniques of language and conversation modeling, again, pairing them with entry-based AI, so that we can deal with our sign language words in reduced modalities, um, and look for inconsistencies between modalities to still give, give us a best guess of what is that sign that you actually just said. Um, of course, Auslan doesn't address everything and I am leaving as future questions things like multiple input modalities and encoding more than gesture at this point in time. So, on to my project. 
I plan to develop the Auslan Communication Technologies Pipeline, which is going to be a modular system that enables Auslan in, Auslan out interactions. The plan is that the three modules should interface so that module one, recognition, is able to recognize Auslan signs. Module two, the processing module, is able to provide the functionality based on that input, generate a response, and then the production module will generate an Auslan response. So to do Auslan recognition, we need to start off by collecting an Auslan data set. Now the ideal data for this is going to be a combination of video and depth. Um, I want to collect data from native signers, professional signers, so interpreters, and also learner signers. Now the core of the data set, the gold standard, is going to be native sign produced by native signers. But having learners and professional signers is going to ensure that we're capturing the complexity of intersigner variation, um, as well as enabling some experiments around entropy-based AI of what if someone is signing something slightly wrong? Can we still catch that? Once we have the video, the data needs to be encoded. Um, I'm going to be following the lead of Professor Trevor Johnson, who has developed um, annotation guidelines for the linguistic Auslan corpus, which already exists. Um, the reason that we can't use that whole data set for this project is because the way it was collected means that it includes sensitive private information about people talking about private, sen private sensitive topics, fully identifiable because you can't capture Auslan signs without the face. Um, whereas the data set that we're looking to develop should be entirely open source. Um, so once we have the coded data, we'll develop a prototype machine learning system based on entry-based AI. Now, I know this slide is a lot. Don't necessarily focus on what's going on on the screen. It's trying to break down the design of how the machine learning system should work. Um, but I'm gonna run through and explain sort of what's going on. The idea here is that there are canonical versions of science that look a particular way that we can define. The example that I'm using here is funny. Now, much like in English, in Auslan, funny can mean funny ha-ha or funny strange. And the only difference between these two signs is in the facial expression and a bit of the body language. But when you see it produced canonically, it is the hook handshape in roughly this orientation. There is a location on the cheek, a movement of tapping, and then the facial expression. So the idea with entropy-based AI is that you can treat any kind of data as a synthetic language by breaking up the input into particular symbols that you can recombine into words. And this allows us to track across whatever data it is, in our case, Auslan video, but we've also seen it work on um, things as diverse as recognizing authorship of written text, um, identifying causes um, for people with dementia. Uh, and I was quite amused to see the one of uh, uh, um, meerkats and picking up their language. Um, so applying it to sign language. My idea here is that we can use each of the home elements to, as one channel and one set of symbols. So we can have part of the system that's going to focus on what is the handshape or possibly handshape combined with orientation. We can have part of the channel that focuses on the face, recognizing expression, doing something like lip reading, looking for Auslan specific types of facial movements. And then the idea is the system should be able to do a comparison between the canonical signs that it knows and the input that it gets in the video stream. 
So in this particular example here, we end up with two frames that look like the canonical hook. And one frame here that looks similar, but is not quite enough to tell us what's going on. Because we've got the gesture part of funny, but we don't quite have the expression to give us the differentiating information. Here we don't have enough, but this is where you would start looking into things like uh, Epenthes, um, which is, you know, has this sign ended? Are we moving on to the next one? So uh, stage two of this project involves module production. So if you're, uh, Auslan production. So if you remember the modules we had started with recognition, then processing, then production. So we're sort of starting with a bit of a sandwich and jumping to a processing at the end. So with the Auslan production phase, I really want to work with the deaf community and DST to figure out what are the right requirements for sign production. There's a few different approaches that we could use here. Things like having animations, sign elements, uh, like video segments that you can chop together, or using generative adversarial networks to try and create video on the fly. Um, so it's going to be important to work with both DST and the deaf community to make sure the approach that we choose is respectful, appropriate, um, and also clear. Um, this then allows us to create a prototype production system that's able to take as input the kind of uh, encoding that we'll be getting from um, our recognition system to produce output. The third module is Auslan processing. This one again is going to require a lot of consultation with the deaf community and DST to figure out exactly what this looks like. There's a few different options. The one I'd really like to explore and I'm hoping will be the most acceptable to both DST and the Australian deaf community is um, a basically Siri for sign language, but you know, prototype version. Um, so that we're seeing the way that you would interact with a human machine gestural interface. This is of course a big project and I have a lot of questions to address in each of these phases. Um, if people do wanna go into more detail with these questions, I do have some extra slides for them at the end, but I wanted to highlight a couple of questions for each phase that I think is really important. So for Auslan recognition, we're trying to solve problems like how can entry-based AI methods support accuracy and trustworthiness of sign classification, especially considering inter-sign variability? How can uh, AI techniques like incremental learning, zero-shot learning, or other similar paradigms allow for extensibility of Auslan recognition? In terms of production, we need to examine what are the key issues to be addressed in virtual sign production? How can signs with varying degrees of lexicalization be encoded for production? What probabilistic encoding framework or symbolization can be used for capturing natural expressions, emotions, and body movements, and other similar features? For processing, we're going to have to examine how well can existing natural language processing approaches be converted to work with sign language processing? Can the use of a video data set reduce the need for a written notation in sign language processing? And how can an Auslan processing system utilize less lexicalized sign communication? So to conclude, Auslan is representative of the types of communication which could be required in human robot teaming. The gesture-based communication between soldiers and robots needs both the theoretical and practical foundations from visual gestural languages such as Auslan, which formalize communication through gesture and movement. This project is working in collaboration with the DST Kelpie project, with Still in negotiations over the exact terms and conditions of the CRA, but I'm expecting that we're going to be developing the technologies together. We're expecting that all of the technologies and the theories that we're developing across this process are going to end up sort of spinning off into both um, industry translation that will help the deaf community, 
and also the Kelpie project and addressing some of their problems. So a good example of this is intersinar variation. Having uh, robustness around intersinar variation is important in uh, industry and community applications because it allows for better recognition of signs. So the Kelpie project, it becomes incredibly important around, as we've discussed, uh, security, because if we can tell the difference between different people signing, then we might be able to recognize whether or not someone is authorized to sign a command to a robot. But it can also promote the uh, individual variation in sign. So if you are, say, not directly facing the robot, you're a bit turned away, um, or if you're under a high stress situation, um, the way you sign or gesture will be different. So being able to support that means that we're going to end up with better technologies for Kelpie. There is an intention for joint publications and we've actually already had our first publication at the ECCV SLRTP workshop. Um, and we're also hoping that there might be some opportunities for co-supervision of students in this area. As I've been hinting, there's a lot of opportunity for industry translation. Any of the Auslan communication tools that are developed are going to have an audience in the Australian deaf community and also for learners of Australian Sign Language. There's opportunities for gestural interfaces, sign language interfaces, and potentially individualized gestural interfaces that could be set up to respond to a particular user's gestures and style. Much longer term, we could be looking at things like robots with body language awareness and nonverbal communication. Um, and again, much longer term, this addresses some of those future questions I mentioned before, but you could have really robust multimodal human machine interaction where you could have visually or haptically processed gestures, multimodal encoding that captures context awareness and environment awareness. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you for listening. Huge thanks go to all of the project mentors and Dr. Gabby Hodge, um, who have given feedback and comments that have helped to shape this over the time. Um, at this point, we'd like to open up the floor to questions. Thanks very much, uh, Jessica. That was really, really interesting. And I think, um, you know, central to your program of work is this, nat this notion of naturalistic interactions with robots, which is ultimately where we want to go if we want to treat robotic systems as teammates um, and, and not as, uh, as objects that we just merely control. So a really important piece of work. There are a few questions in chat. I might actually call on the people who ask the questions to, to speak up rather than me reading them out. So Pauline, do you want to um, pick up on your question? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to jump in. So I had a question about what the trade-off is in terms of gestural uh, human-machine interfaces versus other um, signing techniques that are more specific, such as finger spelling, where the, um, the detail is higher, um, but it takes you longer to do it. How much precision can you get with gestural um, languages versus um, the benefits in speed? Can you comment on that one? Yeah. So this is actually one of the things that I find really frustrating in the existing literature around AI and machine learning approaches to sign language. Um, everyone who clearly doesn't know any sign language goes, we did letter signs and maybe number signs. Um, and this is particularly frustrating because if you speak to a deaf person, they hardly ever use letter, letter signs. Um, the fact that you've got you know, the full language and the full expressiveness of a sign language um, means that you've, like, you can convey anything in Auslan that you could convey in English. Um, you're not really losing precision uh, in the communication because signs do have specific meanings. Um, from the AI perspective, where things get a bit more interesting is once you get into the, um, semi-lexical and non-lexical gestures um, that are still have, in the case of semi-lexical gestures, still have set meanings, but get modified. In the case of non-lexical that don't have a set meaning, but definitely mean something in the context of the conversation. 
Um, does that sort of, I'm aware I took a little bit of a sidestep there, but does that kind of help answer the question? Um, a little bit. I mean, the example that, um, that I might give is if I wanted something put in a particular place, is it going to take me to explain exactly where on the table to put it in terms of signing um, versus if I was to basically spell it out? Uh, as an encoding system, the more precise one's encoding is, um, the more symbols it requires to convey it. And so there's, there's a decision as to what type of symbols are going to best capture the breadth of likely to be communicated things that you wanted to have. For instance, if you knew that a robot only ever had to do one of two things, you could define you know, a um, three symbol um, communication system, which is do thing one, do thing two, or do nothing at all. Um, when you go from something like fingerspelling, where it's encoded as a as basically written language, but spelled out, to something which is gestural, um, how do your symbols span the space in terms of precision because you're going to have more gestures, presumably, to get more accurate um, definitions of individual points in the space of all possible meanings, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, so I'm actually going to jump on the example you gave of like, I want to tell my robot to put something in a specific place on a table. Um, Auslan is actually going to be better at this than English in some ways, because the way you would gesture or sign that, um, you would sign out the space so you would say you know this is the tabletop um see the orange cup is there see you know the white um you know the white box is over here i want you uh, so i want you to put it down you know the orange cup here put it beside the orange cup um, so we're able to sort of map out in the signing space what the, the destination space should look like and convey in that way, this is the behaviour we want to see. There's a really interesting connection to that in terms of pointing and how humans uh, Pauline, infer the meaning of Pauline. pointing. So that's really useful. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. I, I, I probably need to move on. Um, yep. Mel, I think that's Mel Ralph. I'm not quite sure. It just says Mel, uh, but Mel Ralph. It, it is Mel Ralph. Thanks. Mark. Yeah, yeah. So Sorry. go ahead. You had a couple that's of That's my poor uh, no, um, naming. Um, yeah, a couple of questions, Jess. Um, really good presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning the importance of some of the other aspects of interaction with machines, like voice, um, human pose, and the non visual gesture. Are they, or how will they be considered in this study, or is that out of scope? Yep. So um, the voice stuff I'm probably going to say is out of scope. Yep. Um, the pose and body language is something I'd like to explore if I get time, but it is kind of uh, slightly unsure. Um, where we're going to be focusing is on those home elements, which does include the expression or non-manual features element. Um, so there will definitely be some exploration of how expression can modify meaning. Okay, cool. And one other question that's not related. Um, ha have you taken into consideration um, the military environment with the use of Auslan in terms of uh, a lot of military environments are, are cluttered with things like dust or trees and often uh, the vehicle that's being controlled won't necessarily be within visual range of the, of the signer. Um, has that been considered as part of this or is this more about understanding getting the signing right? I think it's it's about getting the signing right for now. Um, I do have this vague sort of idea that once we can, once we prove that yes, Auslan is a good vehicle for this, we can draw out the theoretical gesture recognition approaches. Um, the input would change, but you could do quite easily some sort of haptic, whether that's a bracelet or hand sensors or whatever, um, different input but you could eventually like translate that into something that gets sent by radio signal or what have you. Um, there's actually in the proposal document for this project, we did talk about different, uh, making sure we're collecting signs from different perspectives, um, including like from the over the shoulder view, side views, front on views, to recognize the fact that, you know, you will not always have this perfect the robot's right in front of me and I just sign it and it knows what I'm doing. 
No, cool. That's good, Jess. Thank you. Um, we can talk about those uh, mechanical means or radio controlled means if you want to at some point. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Mel. Uh, Rob Fitch, you, you had a question. I, it may have partly been answered already, but did you want to um, at least pick that up and make a comment? I can ask a different question. Sure. <laughs> One question. Uh, yeah, so I, I started with the observation. Um, so on one of the slides, you, there was a diagram that looked almost like a grammar. So if everybody's familiar with the grammar, that's a sort of classical way of, you know, doing um, text processing or natural language processing and you write poetry in a generative way. Uh, so that kind of made me think, well, if we're just generating sequences of English words, then it just equivalent to a text processing problem. So I was, so Mel asked um, the question I was going to ask, but I can follow on. So one of the things that um, that's different from text processing would be this, this idea of context and visual cues. Um, so if you go back to that idea of a grammar, so is your approach to sort of, you know, augment augment what would ordinarily be just sort of a text grammar with these um, other modalities, so sort of you know, visual indications or you know, symbols that are coming from, you know, um, from something other than the sign itself? Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure which diagram you meant. Um, I've jumped to this one because if we're starting to talk about grammars and context, to my mind, this falls into the Auslan processing sphere. Um, yeah, the one that said entropy-based AI was the title. Uh, these ones? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, could you perhaps uh, go over the question again? Uh, yeah, so now maybe I was um, leaping a little bit, leaping a little bit ahead with thinking into the grammar, but um, So you've got so you've got a set of, of like possible interpretations of a string of signs, and you're evaluating those with some entropy-based method. And if it was simply, you know, one sign maps to an English word, then that's a then you could just use a grammar like you know, established thing. So then the question is, what are your what are your thoughts on integrating? The, the elements of sign language that are, are in, would be in addition to text processing. Um, and those could include the idea of when you said, you know, you could point to something or, you know, kind of ground a symbol by, by sort of gesturing um, in relation to an object in the scene. So, you know, if you want to say table, you sort of make a sign that says this table. So you're sort of creating a new symbol there. You know, are you thinking of that? Are you thinking of in integrating those sorts of modalities into kind of the traditional um, grammar-based approaches for understanding text? Yeah, so this is an area that uh, doesn't seem to have been explored too much um, in terms of what, say, natural language processing approaches already exist um, and how they can be applied to sign language. And the big gap seems to be that sign languages don't really have a written equivalent. Um, you're already translating them as soon as you're writing in English. Um, so this is one of the things that I'm really keen to explore in phase three is, you know, can we use either the videos or the encoding to capture the meaning and the form of the signs? Not like, I suspect we'll find that the lexical signs um, translate quite well into natural language processing as long as we can find a good way to represent them. Um, the challenge, I think, is going to be making sure that we capture the meaning and the context of your non-lexical signs. Thank you. Uh, Gregory, Gregory Sherman, did you want to um, ask your question? I think you're still online. Perhaps not. Um, 
Gregory is muted or, or perhaps having audio trouble. Um, I might repeat his question for him, uh, if that's okay, Jessica. So Gregory makes the point that he's actually partly deaf. Um, so this is this obviously has direct relevance to him. He said, I'm wondering if there are large enough collections of various gestures as data sets that deal with conflicting signals. Um, okay, it doesn't look like he's here, but I'm assuming they mean uh, conflicting signals as in gesture and speech at the same time. Uh, uh, hi, Jessica, uh, Guy Galash. I can probably clarify that a little bit. Yep. Uh, having sat in many, many meetings with Greg Sherman, <laughs> Um, yeah, so Greg is probably, my, my suspicion he, is he's referring to gestures that are not, it's not clear whether it's one gesture or, or another gesture, um, where you have a gesture that's halfway in between and how you, how you decide which gesture that is. Uh, so if you think of it in terms of label data sets, you know, things like the, the MNIST um, recognition of, of characters and so on you get some pretty funky looking characters, you know, letters and numbers that are very hard even for a human to decide what they are. Um, so to get around that, you have very large data sets. And so this question's come up a lot of times in the work that we've been doing. So <laughs> I'll let you answer that. I think I probably could, but uh, I'll let you answer that one. So um, this is part of the reason that I'm wanting to collect data from learner sinus, um, because the thought here is learner signers will do a lot of things close to correct, but not 100%. Um, I believe someone told me that statistically speaking, learner signers will produce signs, but get the handshakes wrong. So instead of signing funny, they might say funny or something like that. Um, so the idea here with the entropy based AI stuff is that once we've got the system up and running, it should be robust enough that if we're seeing a sign, you know, not funny, but signed like this, that we can judge from the, you know, that's not actually a sign, but it's similar to these signs. Based on the context of what we've been talking about, you know, we were just talking about jokes. They probably mean funny um, or something like that. Um, so that's what's exciting about the entry-based AI approach because it's got this sort of multi-channel thing going on. We can look across the different channels and go, you know, four of the five channels are saying it's probably this sign, but one channel is wrong or perhaps one channel is missing. So if say I was signing like this, you would not necessarily know what hand shape I'm making on the hidden cheek, but you're seeing, you know, movement of tapping um, you're seeing that my hand is probably on that cheek. You can make a bit of a guess. Uh, Paul Hornsby has a question. Paul, are you still your audio? Maybe Paul doesn't have audio. Um, uh, yeah, no, I have. Can you can you hear me okay? Ahead. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jessica, um, excellent presentation. I, I, you know, with my military hat on, I can see a lot of applications in uh, ground, littoral and maritime operations. Uh, one of the key ones I've got is we're, we're developing some very uh, advanced optical laser and hyperspectral, multispectral systems that go into unmanned, uh, well, unmanned aerial vehicles normally that can recognize very small gestures. I mean, they can do facial recognition, but that's another subject uh, at quite some range. This is, Auslan's obviously deliberate. Um, uh, so how could, um, I mean, uh, how, how, what, I don't know the answer to this. What is the hypothetical range that you can see um, uh, Auslan gestures if you had, um, uh, if you had the right technology, I mean, this is really important to us. You'd, you'd be aware Navy for a thousand years have been, used, well, yeah, almost, uh, semaphore, which is hand signals. And so this, uh, this, uh, applying Auslan to you know, military applications, um, would be a pretty easy fit, particularly in, uh, maritime operations. Uh, I'll just leave that out there as to, how you do raise a point that if you if you're turned or you know one way or another, uh, you may miss something, and obviously that needs to go into the AI 
as to you know, what did I miss in that? Yeah, was the cheek tapped or not? Um, your comments. Uh, I don't. I don't know the answer as to how far you can. Yeah, I know roughly the answer. How you can do biometrics, but where you've been deliberate, uh, that is that is certainly worthy of uh, exploring. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, was my mute button? Yeah. Um, so that one, I'm. I feel like that one comes down to the whatever the sensing technology you're using, whatever range it's capable of. Um, with obviously some caveats of you're going to do better, you know, side on if you're up close. Um, for something behind, you almost need to have the like over the shoulder or a body cam or something. Um, but there's definitely some movements that you can detect from the behind. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, we use, uh, you know, sign language, <laughs> yeah, military sign language is used a lot in special ops and close and ground, ground ops. Um, and it is, but obviously uh, utilising something like Auslan gives you you know, a much broader vocabulary, for want of a better word, compared to the sort of ICU, sort of the, you know, finger, you know, minimal fingers that currently use. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting where, where you've got a deliberate sign language as to how far that could get. That, uh, th thanks for that, Jessica. I, I, yeah, didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but you have what you have done is uh, 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 extrapolated uh, what the issues are if you're turned or, or behind, and whether there are ways and means to get around that. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question, so that people still have time to get to the next meeting. Uh, David Johnson, if you're still online, did you want to pick up on your question? David Johnson appears to be online, but maybe muted. Um, he, he raises the issue of interoperability. So he asked, first of all, uh, how does Auslan compare uh, to other sign languages in terms of expressiveness? Um, and then uh, secondly asks, what, what would the impact be on interoperability if you had to interact with another nation's robotic systems, for example? Okay, so in terms of expressiveness, not being a linguist, so like caveat there, um, my understanding is uh, sign, all national sign languages are similar levels of expressive. Um, there are some, I have heard some things from linguists working with smaller sign languages, community sign languages, or like ones that tend to spring up in isolated villages around one deaf person. Um, start off less expressive, but rather quickly evolve to a full expressiveness because humans like communicating. Um, you know, having the tools to convey something fully is really important. And so we see languages sort of evolve towards that. Um, in terms of interoperability, um, you've so it depends on how, how much everyone buys into using their national sign language. Um, I can say from a linguistic development perspective, Australian sign language uh, is in the same language family as say British sign language, New Zealand sign language and South African sign language. Um, but they are still different languages. So to the point where, you know, someone who signs in Auslan and someone who signs in British Sign Language can have a conversation, but there will def definitely be moments of confusion. Um, I like to compare this to the fact that you have someone who speaks Australian English and someone who speaks American English and you still have moments of confusion. Um, but then there's a you know, further difference between languages like ASL, which is American Sign Language, French Sign Language, French sign language um, and even Irish sign language um, which have developed along different paths and are therefore quite different. Uh, could I just add something to that as well from a DST perspective? Oh, if I may. So Guy Galash again. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say hi to uh, David Johnson who uh, doesn't have a microphone. Um, I hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah so keep in mind that the, the language that we choose to use for defense purposes doesn't necessarily have to be Auslan. So Auslan is a very good example, a good exemplar of the sorts of things we would like to see in a language and the sorts of 
you know, the development of the underlying technologies that would support Auslan uh, would also support the work that we want to do with Kelpie. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily wedded or tied to Auslan, um, but it's things like the use of entropy, entropy based AI to improve robustness and all these other sorts of things that are, are really the things that are of interest. That sounds like a great way to finish the session. Thanks, Guy. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you, Jessica, and the audience. Uh, really great talk. The video, as I said, will be available. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, there is a seminar next month on the 30th of October by Dr. Beth Cardio, who's actually going to be talking about um, how you might deal with open world problems, which most people in AI know is the, the bugbear of all AI systems. So register for that, the link's in the chat. And, um, and with that, unless uh, you wanted to say anything in, in closing, Jessica, I'll, I'll close it up. Did you want to say anything? Um, thanks everyone. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. You have a good day uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks Jess, good talk, see ya. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, we will get all of the paperwork sorted out sooner or later. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, no hair left. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Out of the recording. <laughs> oh, excellent. Sorry, yes, you're still recording. But yeah, that's all right. I'll uh, give you a call at some point soon as well. So, no. all right, thank you. Cheers. <laughs>